Alexander died without sons. His only daughter, Margaret, was married to the King of Norway, and Scotland had no desire for a Norwegian ruler. Accordingly, a provisional government was formed, consisting of six guardians of the peace. Acting as a regency, this council decided to confer the crown on Margaret of Norway's daughter, also named Margaret, who was then an infant. It was arranged that the child, on attaining her maturity, would marry Prince Edward, subsequently Edward II of England. But in 1290, on route home from Norway, the young Margaret died, and the question of the Scottish succession was plunged into turmoil. More than a dozen candidates presented themselves as claimants to the throne, including John Balliol and the grandfather of Robert Bruce, known as the competitor. So great was the danger of civil war that the Bishop of St. Andrews invited Edward I of England to arbitrate. Thus the Norman monarchy of England received a mandate to intervene in the affairs of the Celtic Kingdom of Scotland. Edward wasted no time in turning this mandate to his own advantage. When he met with the Scottish claimants in 1291, he proceeded to claim suzerainty over Scotland for himself. Despite protests, the Scottish lords were bullied and intimidated into at least a partial acknowledgement of the English king's self-arrogated status. Having extorted this acknowledgement, he judged the succession to devolve upon John Balliol, who had a legitimate claim, and was duly crowned at Scone. Edward immediately reneged on his promises to respect Scottish independence, demanding a humiliating obedience and fealty from the man he had placed on the throne. By 1294, the English king's demands had goaded the Scots into rebellion. An alliance was formed with France, and Balliol, in 1296, repudiated his allegiance to Edward. By then, however, it was too late. The Scots were defeated. Balliol, having surrendered, was publicly humiliated and eventually went into exile. With Scotland at his feet, Edward embarked on a systematic campaign to eradicate all vestiges, both political and religious, of the old Celtic kingdom. The Stone of Scone, most archaic and sacred of Celtic talismans, was accorded special attention. At Edward's behest, the inscription on it was erased and the stone itself removed from Scone and brought to London. The Great Seal of Scotland was smashed and coffers of royal records were confiscated. Edward appointed himself, in effect, an ad hoc defender of the faith. To bolster this image, it was profitable to emphasize the pagan aspects of the old Celtic kingdom, which were portrayed as heretical, if not pagan and satanic. By disseminating rumors of sorcery and necromancy, Edward was able to show moral and theological justification for his crusade to annex Scotland. Having quelled all resistance in the country, Edward left its government in the hands of his own appointee, the Earl of Warren. Warren remained arrogantly disdainful of his role, and a year later, in 1297, William Wallace gave the signal for a general rising by assassinating the Sheriff of Lanark. He then proceeded, with William Douglas, to attack the pro-English judiciary at Scone. Wallace's insurrection was coordinated with similar activity elsewhere under the leadership of the Bishop of Glasgow and James the Stuart. It was against this turbulent background that the figure of Robert Bruce suddenly emerged, fomenting rebellion in the South. Bruce had already been made Earl of Carrick, one of the largest, most powerful and most deeply Celtic fiefdoms in the country, encompassing most of the western region known as Galloway. His followers and vassals controlled vast tracts of land in Ulster, including all of North Antrim, parts of what is now County Londonderry and Rathlin Island off the coast. Bruce's own holdings, apart from Carrick, included a third of the fiefdoms of Huntingdon, Geary, and Dundee. As we have seen, Bruce was of royal blood, his great-grandfather having married into the line descended from David I. Towards the end of 1297, Wallace contrived to secure the election of William Lamberton, Chancellor of Glasgow Cathedral, as Bishop of St. Andrews, Scotland's premier bishopric. Lamberton being a fierce patriot, his investiture, it was hoped, would strengthen the Scottish cause. He promptly embarked for Rome to have his election confirmed by the Pope and to appeal to the papacy on behalf of his comrades in arms. Meanwhile, Wallace was knighted by a prominent Scottish earl and in 1298 was elected sole guardian of the country. By the spring of that year, however, the revolt had provoked another full-scale English invasion. On 19 to 20 July 1298, the English army of 2,000 horse and 12,000 foot pitched camp near Falkirk, on the Templar estates of Temple Liston. 
Edward's forces were supported by a contingent of Templars and included, significantly enough, two of the Order's high dignitaries, the Master of England and the Preceptor of Scotland. At this time, the Temple had not yet come under persecution and had no particular reason to feel threatened. Even so, its alignment with the English king was highly irregular, an anomaly for which historians have offered no satisfactory explanation. The Templars had always been strictly forbidden to participate in secular warfare, especially against a Christian monarch. Their sole raison d'etre was to engage in a very specific kind of conflict, the Crusade, which was scrupulously defined as hostilities conducted against the infidel. The Scots were hardly infidels, and Scotland was under papal protection. Indeed, Bishop Lamberton had just been personally confirmed in his appointment by Pope Boniface VIII. The only explanation for the Templar involvement is that the pagan or old Celtic practices among the rebel Scots were sufficiently prominent to warn a species of mini-crusade. In any case, at the Battle of Falkirk, on July 22, 1298, the Scots were badly savaged. English losses were negligible. Only two major figures, in fact, were killed on the English side. These were the two high dignitaries of the temple. Following his defeat at Falkirk, Wallace was forced to resign as guardian, but this did not terminate the revolt. In the autumn of 1298, the rebels appointed John Coman and Robert Bruce to preside as joint guardians and continue the struggle. They, however, soon fell to squabbling among themselves, and the friction between them not only deflected them from concerted action against the English, but also nearly got Bruce killed. In 1299, therefore, when Bishop Lamberton returned from Rome, he was appointed third guardian to arbitrate between his compatriots. In fact, Lamberton was strongly sympathetic towards Bruce and was soon embroiled in his own quarrel with Coman. Disgusted by all this discord, Bruce resigned, leaving Scotland temporarily in the hands of Coman and Lamberton, and proceeded to consolidate his position by other means. These entailed two important dynastic alliances. Early in the 1290s, Bruce had married Isabel, daughter of the Earl of Mar, while his sister, Christina, married Isabel's brother, who succeeded to the earldom. By his marriage to Isabel of Mar, Bruce had had a daughter, Marjorie, who in 1315 was to marry Walter, son of James the Stuart. But in 1302, Isabel of Mar having died, Bruce undertook, with impressive expediency, the forging of a temporary alliance with the English. He married Elizabeth de Burgh, daughter of the Earl of Ulster, a loyal supporter of the English king. Since the days of the Dalriada, there had been a close connection, both cultural and political, between Ulster and Bruce's own earldom of Carrick. This is discernible even today in the frequency with which Carrick figures as a prefix for place names in Northern Ireland. By marrying the daughter of the Earl of Ulster, Bruce was able to reactivate the old allegiances between his own fiefdom in Scotland and the Irish lands owned by the former lords of Carrick. He was now in a position to muster considerable support and manpower from across the Irish Sea. And with allies in Ulster, a crucial maritime route could be kept open for supplies and material. In the meantime, the revolt continued without him. At the Battle of Rosslyn in 1303, Coman defeated a small English contingent. This, however, proved a short-lived success, for in 1304 Edward invaded Scotland again, forcing Coman to submit and swear allegiance to the English crown. In 1305, the cause of Scottish independence deteriorated further with the capture of Wallace. With a barbarity extreme even in the Middle Ages, Wallace was, quite literally, overkilled. He was dragged behind a horse for four miles from Westminster to Smithfield, castrated, hanged, cut down while still alive, disembowel led, and decapitated. His body was dismembered into four pieces which were placed on display in different locations.